In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the AutoHoot Design 8 fountain pen. I'll go over the specs, I'll do a writing sample, and I'll tell you what I like and don't like about this pen coming up. Blake here with Blake's Broadcast. On this channel, I review fountain pens, paper, and ink. And as always, I put links in the show notes in the description below. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps out my channel. All right, let's get on with the review. This is the Auto Hoot Design 8 fountain pen. This is the first fountain pen from Auto Hoot that I have owned. And it's a really interesting pen. I have a lot of mixed feelings about this pen. I feel like there's some contradictions. This is a pen that I believe retails for like a thousand euros and the I think retail price in the United States is $1,500, a street price $1,200. That's a lot of money for a pen that I think looks like this. Now, I want to start with a little bit of history on Otto Hoot. Otto Hoot is a German manufacturer that's been around since 1920, so over 100 years old. Their specialty was sterling silver accessories and pens. They have existed in various forms over the years. Uh, in 2016, they relaunched the Auto Hoot brand or launched it as a, a pen manufacturer. You know, when I got into fountain pens, Auto Hoot, I, that wasn't something that was available, at least as a, a pen that was branded that way. But my understanding is that they have been a OEM manufacturer for quite some time. Uh, for other pens, it's been hinted to me that they make pens for Gruff on Faber Castell. I've heard that a couple of times. I, my instinct tells me that's not right, but I don't actually know and they don't disclose their, their clients. They are a very large manufacturer. There have been a couple of good tours of the Auto Hoot factory. I believe Apple Boom did one and there's another one. I'll put links in the description below if you're interested to see that. It's very mechanized, but it's a, a big facility and they produce a large volume of pens. I think a small percentage of that must be Auto Hoot just because you know, this brand is, isn't that prevalent. I mean, they're getting more and more popularity, but, you know, when you see that facility, it's sort of like, yeah, this can't be a large percentage of their production. It's designed by Mark Brown. He is a somewhat well-established industrial designer. His most notable work would be for Nomos Glashuta, which is a German watch manufacturer. Uh, that company basically took some a long and sunny designs from the 1930s and sort of brought them back and Mark Brown's uh, influence on some of the couple of watches that he's done for them has been very minimal, very delicate touch. So I think it's interesting to see a pen like this where he gets to do, well, you know, I haven't seen the design brief, but I think there's maybe more left to him than what he got to do at Nomos Glas Huta. So I, I think this is interesting in that sense. He also did work for Mono, which is a very well-known, at least in Germany or Europe, uh, cutlery uh, manufacturer. They also make some nice kitchen stuff. Just as an example, you know, they do uh, silverware like this. This is pretty high-end. I think like a fork like this is maybe like $50 in steel, and then they do solid sterling silver. I have no idea how much that costs. They also make a teapot that I really like. Uh, everything on this is module, modular, so if anything breaks, you can replace it. You know, it's not the most expensive thing, but it's not cheap either. It's like $200, I want to say. Those sort of things kind of fit into that category of, you know, quality for, for the money. This pen at $1,200 is a really expensive pen. I almost don't consider it in the, the same category as... Uh, you know, I mean, I know this fork is expensive, but this is a Karl Pott design. It's uh, a classic, um, but it's not, I, I'm not looking at it like this is insane. It's expensive, and the teapot is expensive, but, you know, for something that you're going to be using a lot and keep can keep for a long time, it's not that expensive. Now, this goes to a whole nother level because it's $1,200, <laughs> so that's a lot. You know, a Nomos watch is in that range or, or more, but watches are a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated than fountain pens. So at least back in the time of, well, before we had quartz and, you know, electronic watches, uh, that thousand dollar price point would have been a, a pretty entry level kind of watch, generally speaking. So now in terms of like the, the design, 
you know, having a well-known designer doesn't mean that the pen needs to be expensive. You know, we have uh, Naoto Fukusawa's Noto Ballpoint, which is, I think, like $10. And then we have Jasper Morrison's Ion Fountain Pen. Both of these are by Lamy. This is like $80. And then if you go into something that has, like, a really big brand name, like Mont Blanc, uh, they do a pen called the M, or at least they used to, with Mark Newsom, who's probably the most famous uh, industrial designer alive today. I, I kind of think, at least in terms of his projects, I think his projects have been the most prestigious. Uh, but anyway, it's just, you know, the design doesn't make it cost this much. I think it really comes down to the manufacturing, and that is pretty tricky to uh, pin down. Now, I, I read an interview that UK Fountain Pens did, which is a really great fountain pen website. I'll put a link to that below where he's talking about the first pen that he did for Otto Hoot, which was called, I think, the Design C, which was celebrating their 100 years. And this was a sterling silver pen that used the same uh, special kind of piston mechanism, which we'll talk about. That pen, I think, was 2,500 euros, crazy. I think they only made 500 of them, and they're still for sale, so they're not flying off the shelf, which is understandable at that price point. Anyway, he talks about super normal design, which is actually something that... Jasper Morrison and Nato Fukusawa did together. Those are high quality, not too expensive, not overly designed items that you can use every day that will last a long time. This pen, or at least the Design C pen from that interview, he described as democratic luxury, which is a term I've never heard of before. My impression was that it's not necessarily something that he likes or necessarily wants in his life. He talks about how he used an old Chinese fountain pen that he had, and then he has the Auto Hoot Design 1, uh, which he uses he, the Design C that he made. He said he likes for writing, but not for sketching. It's too heavy. This pen, the Design 8, is even heavier than that Design C pen. So, you know, I, I think he views this as a desk pen of luxury, item. I don't know. It's kind of interesting to hear him talk about it, but let's go ahead and walk through the pen. Enough of that annoying preamble there. The design. It's basically a straight cylinder all the way across the pen, and then there's a step down here to the piston knob. Now, out of the cap here, we have this sort of convex dimple there, and then we have OH for auto hoot. Looks really nice. It is a spring-loaded clip here, and it's very straight and sort of squared off, but it's rounded on the the top edge here. It looks really good. I love the look of this. When I first saw it, I wanted to have it before I knew even it was a Mark Braun design, but then I saw the price, $1,200, and I was like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, but Atlas Stationers did have it, at I think, for like $500, or maybe a little bit more than $500, and I said, all right, let's give it a go. So very nice looking clip here with a little cut out in the middle and it's, you know, rounded like that inner corner there is rounded. All of the machining on this pen is really excellent and I think that is Otto Hoot's real specialty. Now, Otto Hoot does talk a lot about galoche. You know, they, they talk about how it's a UNESCO, uh, whatever, heritage craft. The kind of galoche that they do here is not really what I think of when I think of galoche. And this is probably rude for me to say, <laughs> like the lowest kind of form of it. And maybe it is really intricate, but I've seen the machines in their, their factory. And, you know, it's like a CNC machine. It's a computerized machine, which I'm sure costs, you know, $100,000 or more. Uh, and then you have to maintain it and set it up. And that's all very expensive. You get these ridges here and it looks nice. But when I think of galoche, you know, going back to watchmaking, like, um, Breguet is probably the most well-known. That's probably their specialty is these galoche dials. And, you know, Patek Philippe and other, you know, historical watch companies, they use these very old machines which have wheels. And it is a excruciatingly tedious and detailed process. They're using like a, a microscope. And the patterns are extremely intricate and beautiful. You can look up like a Claude de Paris Breguet dial and they just, it's incredible what that is. And when you watch somebody use that machine, just the intense skill and patience and steadiness needed to make that is incredible. 
Whereas this is just, you know, it's a robot and it's nothing near as intricate as what I traditionally think of as Guiloche. And I, I have a feeling that's what, you know, the uh, UNESCO is talking about more than this mechanized CNC machine kind of finish here. Now, the pen is solid brass and it has a ruthenium coating on it. One thing that did surprise me is that it does, it is susceptible to fingerprints despite being matte. Yeah, you do get fingerprints on here. It's not something that bothers me a lot, but it is something that I, I do notice. You'll notice that the lines on the cap and the tail here are straight and then they're rounded on the body. I've read that th that's supposed supposedly informed by like the function, the way that you use the pen. I don't, I'm not 100% sure I, I follow that design exactly. You'll also notice that they have a, it says Germany on here and a serial number. Uh, I really do like that they give you a, a serial number. I think that is a nice touch that I'd like to see more pen manufacturers do, especially ones at, at this price point. And then we have another convex cap there. It's a really good looking pen, I have to say. And then taking the, the cap off, we have a PVD coated grip section here. It has a very strange ribbed shape. It looks like a stopper for like a, a plumbing fitting or something that you would stick on there. And then we also have really nice looking threading on here, just very well finished. Everything on this pen is finished really nicely. And then we have a solid 18 karat gold Yovo nib, which is uh, engraved with Otto Hoot's signature design. It's 18 karat gold, and this is an extra fine nib, as you can see there. It's a really good looking nib, number six size nib, so it's a, a big nib. In terms of the, the mechanism, they ha have what's called like the twist and pull mechanism, and this is an innovation. Uh, well, I don't know if it's an innovation. It's something that they patented. It was I've seen like the CAD pictures of it. It's really complicated. And when I first used it, I have to say I, I hated it. Like I tried reading the instructions. I couldn't understand them. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna go for it and try and see if I can't figure it out. And it was sort of like learning a stick shift car for the first time. It's like, where's the, where are the gears there? I'm moving around, you know, grind <laughs> gears. Uh, that's what this, felt like. Uh, but after I used it for a while, I did get more used to it. However, when I go to pick it up after I haven't used it for a month or something, I'm back to square one almost where it's like, all right, this feels weird. So the way that this works is you twist it and then there's a little click there and then you pull it out and then you can turn the piston knob to get the piston inside down to the bottom and it stops. There's a firm stop there. And then when you come back, twist it back. There's no ink window on this pen. And then when you hit the end, there's a click. You can keep clicking it, it won't go any further. So it's pretty smart in that way. And you push it back and it'll snap down and you twist it. And this always kind of lines up with the, the nib. Um, so that's, it's pretty nice. But yeah, when you first get this, First of all, don't even bother with the instructions. I, <laughs> they're in English, but boy, could I not understand what the heck it was saying. Watch a, a video of somebody do it. Watch my video, watch somebody else's video of this pen. That's the best way to do it. I don't think it's that easy to break, so I do like that. You know, the quality of it feels really nice. You can get kind of into a weird in-between spot like this where it's not doing anything. Let's do some measurements here. I would say 138 and then capped. We're looking at 146 millimeters. Posted. I don't know if you can post this pen. You can't post this pen. I mean, it would be so insanely heavy anyway. Yeah, we're at 80 grams. Uh, that's insane. <laughs> you know, the designer Mark Braun said that the design C was basically really heavy, more heavy than you would want it for drawing or using regularly or carrying with you. This is even heavier, 55.2, and this pen is empty. So that's really, really heavy. In terms of comfort, I've gotten more used to it, but I wouldn't really call this that comfortable of a pen. Those ridges on the grip section, they will dig into your hand, especially if you're writing with this for a long time, and it is heavy. 
uh, even uncapped, you know, 55 grams or whatever, that is pretty heavy. This is not a pen I would choose for long writing session. I'm going to be doing this writing sample on a Papermind Mitsubishi Bank Paper Notebook. These notebooks are excellent with fountain pens, and for Blake's broadcast viewers and subscribers, you can get 10% off with code BB10 at checkout. Okay, so this is the Auto Hoot Design 8. This is an extra fine. And this is Hiroshi Zuku Kon Peki. Let's try fast writing. So this nib is, I think, a true extra fine, and it seems like Auto Hoot's nibs are pretty true to size. I also have one of their Design 7 pens in a, a medium, and it's not too wide like a lot of other uh, Western pens, or they're just so much wider. This one is really, I think, a true extra fine, and it's not the most smooth nib. It does have a bit of um, tooth to it. It is nice to write with, but it's definitely not super smooth. I got this on, on sale. They didn't have a wider nib, so if I were to do this again, I would probably go medium or, or fine, because this is quite fine, I think. In terms of flexibility, you can, actually we even got a little railroad there. Uh, there is a little bit there. It's pretty soft. Well, it's somewhat soft. I would be careful about pushing on it. I mean, it's not designed for that. In terms of reverse writing, pretty scratchy, but it, it does it. And it's slightly thinner, I don't know. I probably wouldn't bother with that. I mean, it's already an extra fine. It writes nicely. It's not the smoothest, um, but true to size. So what are my pros and cons for the Auto Hoot Design 8 fountain pen? The biggest pro is definitely the looks. This thing looks really cool. There's no question about it. It's very well made. I like the kind of innovation. Well, I don't know if it's an innovation, but the patented kind of mechanism that we have on the, the piston knob here. I think that is cool. I really like to see that they're thinking kind of outside the box, adding something new that's not already out there. That really gives me a lot of hope and makes me kind of an instant Auto Hoot fan. So I, I really like that. I like that they have a focus on design too. That's really nice to see. Now in terms of cons, there are two major problems. One is the price, $1,200. I just, I can't recommend this pen at that price. It's so expensive. I think the retail is actually 1500 but the street price is 1200 uh, That's too much. I, I just, if this was a Mont Blanc or Aurora, I would say, okay, yes. Because you have the brand story, you have the history, you have pedigree, you make your own nib. You know, this has a Yovo nib. Nice one, but still Yovo nib. I would really like to see Auto Hoot make their own nibs. They have all this amazing uh, machinery. I think they could do it if anyone could do it. So Auto Hoot, please make your own nibs. Uh, and then I will say this pen is worth $1,200. Now, uh, the other con, of course, is the weight. This is 80 grams. That is the heaviest fountain pen that I have, I think, by far. Uh, so comfort is going to be an issue. And then you have these sharp ridges on the grip section. So add that with the weight, and it's just, I can do two pages, uh, A5 size journaling with this, and it's not too bad, but you will be seeing ridges, you know, in your fingers uh, from holding it. It just isn't that comfortable. It does give you good grip, but uh, it's really just not that comfortable. Uh, other cons, the nib, it is on the scratchier side, I mean, it, it, but it's more of a true extra fine, and you know, you put a nice ink in it, like I have Roshizuku Kompeki in here, uh, that really helps a lot, it, 
but if I were to do it again, I definitely would opt for probably a medium nib, uh, which is what I did when I bought their, where is it? Design seven pen, went for the medium, very happy with that. Um, but that's pretty much it. Do you guys have this pen? Do you like this pen? Let me know in the comment section below. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. And if you want to see more fountain pen paper and ink videos, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much. And until next time.